Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday, July 15th Board of Directors meeting. Um, I, I will call to order the meeting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, the next item, roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Ms. Stevens, please. All right, I will go ahead and start the roll call. I'm going to unmute everyone. Just a reminder to anyone on the phones, please hit star six. Okay, and everyone should be able to unmute them, or directors and alternates should be able to. Okay, and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, Eva Henry. Eve Odorizio. Uh, Eva Henry is here. I'm just helping her get logged off. Okay, thank you so much for that. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. William Lindstedt. Heidi Hinkle. Randy Wheelock. Here. George Marlin. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Mike Hoffman. Here. Aaron Brockett. Junie Joseph. Margot Ramson. Adam Cushing. Chris Giordanelli. Roger Hudson. Deborah Mulvey. Here. George Teal. Jason Gray. George Tammy Teal's Mauer. Here. Oh, thank you, George. Tammy Mauer. Mike Sutherland, Jeremy Fay, Randy Wheel. Here. Dale Christie, Nicole Frank, Craig Hurst, Catherine Whitman. I'm here. Jackie Thomas. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Here. Bill Gipp. Linda Montoya. Celeste Arner, Bobby Sindelar, Josie Cockrell. Here. Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Rachel Binkley. <clears throat> Brian Tushair. Jim Dale. Here. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton, Tim Barnes, Jacob LeBure, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Pamela Grove, Larry Strock. Present. Wynne Shaw. Present. Joan Peck. Marsha Martin. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Barney Drystadt. Joyce Palzuski, Colleen Whitlow, here. Paul Sutton, Sean Perret, Christopher Larson, Julie Dran Mullica, Joyce Downing, Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, here. Jessica Sandgren, Herb Atchison, yes. Bud Starker. Here. Rebecca White. Here. Adam Zarin. Bill Van Meter. Here. Okay. Uh, and then uh, obviously, if there's anyone on the phones or anyone that I missed, please go ahead and state your name now for the record. Uh, this is John Peck. I just logged on. Libby Zabo. That's here. Thank you, Libby. Aaron Brockett, City of Boulder here. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, anyone else? Melinda All Jacob right, Lebeer has oh. wrote, wrote into the uh, questions. Perfect, and I also see a hand raised from uh, Stephanie Walton. Uh, Stephanie, I recognize that you are here in attendance. Thank you, hi. Thank you, hi, okay. And I think with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, one housekeeping item under new members and alternates. 
not really a new member, but a changing of the guard in City of Decono. Uh, the new representative for City of Decono is uh, Catherine Whitman. Uh, welcome, uh, Director Whitman. And the alternate is Jackie Thomas. Uh, so again, I, I believe Jackie was was the representative and Catherine was the alternate. They just uh, switched. So um, thank you and welcome, welcome to the big show. Uh, the next item thank you. Is, it, is approval of the agenda. Uh, I am looking for uh, any questions, comments, or a motion, please. So moved. Second. Perfect. All right. Second. Okay, uh, so Director Atchison, we have uh, uh, the motion, a second. Um, sounded like Director Flynn. We're gonna vote. Okay, people, first vote of the night. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, nay, please identify. Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We do have an agenda. Uh, the next item, report of the chair. Uh, the only item I have is uh, I was um, fortunate enough to uh, to be with um, uh, Director Lou uh, from CDOT and Executive Director Rex to uh, uh, be a part of announcing the Safe Main Streets Initiative, uh, otherwise known as the Urban Arterials. I'm sure Executive Director Rex will give us lots of details in his Executive Director report. And with that, I would like to go to the report on performance and engagement committee. Um, Director Flynn. Hello, uh, just trying to unmute there for a second. Uh, two, uh, two items to report on. First, uh, uh, we uh, had a, another uh, lengthy discussion and reached a, a recommendation on the, uh, the uh, annual awards celebration. And we have uh, recommended that we hold the event on April 28th, 2021 at Empower Field at Mile High, the same location. Uh, we are going to, uh, we recommended honoring only the slate of winners that were selected for this year. Uh, the uh, prime consideration there was that we didn't want to uh, combine two years into one celebration because of the time factor uh, that's involved. It's already a lengthy ceremony and we didn't want it to go on any longer. Uh, and uh, so we uh, recommend holding the spring 2021 event. Um, hopefully everything will get back to normal in, in 2022. Uh, this will be like one of those years where there wasn't a World Series uh, because of the war or something like that. Uh, the, uh, the other item was that, and, and all the directors yesterday should have received in their email a, uh, a report of the collaboration assessment that was done. I wanted to thank all the directors who participated. We had some pretty good uh, participation this year. And if you look at the accompanying uh, summary chart, uh, you'll see that from the time we began in 2015, there's really an upward trend in in uh, the in the uh, positive uh, assessments that we get from the members and the directors. I almost thought I was looking at a COVID chart for a second. It was uh, it was uh, doing so well. So please, uh, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to uh, Director Rex or Jerry Stigel about it. And uh, that's my report, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, the next item, report on Finance and Budget Committee. Director Conklin, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we had two meetings tonight. The uh, Finance and Budget Committee also serves as the board for what's called the uh, Regional Response Incorporated, which meets federal 501c3 requirements and is empowered to contract with and accept grants, funds, and gifts. So tonight we had the annual meeting and we had the uh, heard the uh, audit of that group. And then the Finance and Budget Committee met. We discussed a resolution authorizing Mr. Rex to accept funds from the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies up to $200,000 for approximately one year ending in June of 2021 to administer a regional state health insurance assistance program. We also approved uh, Executive Director Rex being able to accept funds at a little over $300,000 from the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing for the period of July 1st, 2020 to June 30th of 2021 to support Dr. Cog's Community Options Program. 
And then we had two informational items. We uh, heard the Dr. Cog 2019 audit. Uh, we appreciated that. It was a, a very positive audit. And we appreciated the time that the auditor and their staff and also Jenny and her staff took on that process. So had a, a very positive audit. And then we also discussed the plan of Dr. Cog changing its fiscal year, which I'll defer to, Dr., uh, to Director Rex if he wants to uh, speak at that, about that in more detail. And that is my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. Uh, next item, report of the Executive Director. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, I, I'll, I'll just speak right to the audit right away that uh, Director Conklin was referring to, and, and I won't get into the details, obviously, but if anybody is interested in um, in, in in seeing that the audit report, um, they can either reach out to me directly and I can send it to you directly, or you can get onto the Finance and Budget Committee uh, agenda that, that we just had, and, um, and the audit is contained within that agenda. So um, yeah, again, I as I mentioned in the Finance and Budget Committee, I do want to thank Jenny Dock, our Finance Director, and, and her team for tremendous work that they've done over the past year and giving us that positive, positive audit. Um, as I mentioned, also in finance and budget, it's terribly hard sometimes to keep us all in line, and uh, they do a great job of doing so. So thank you all very much. Um, I did want to give you a COVID update as as it relates to Dr. Cog and and our staff. I, I mentioned last time that we talked about moving into a phase one transition back to the office, and that was going to occur in in the middle of July, but we uh, we postponed that until August third. Um, again, safety remains the number one consideration for us moving forward, and um, we're, we believe we're nimble enough that you know we're kind of watching over the next couple of weeks to see what happens. But right now, as we sit here tonight, we are talking about implementing our phase one, our voluntary phase um, of transitioning back to the office. So, um, so we're interested to get some data points associated with that to make sure that uh, once we proceed to the next phase of that plan that we have our, our ducks in a row and enough information to make sure that it's uh, that it's as comprehensive and as clean as possible. Um, my next, I would like to talk about that the, what the chairman referred to earlier is the Safer Main Streets Initiative, which, as he mentioned, was uh, what we were calling for a while the Urban Arterial Safety Program. And we've had several board presentations on this, and and got your concurrence on the uh, the partnership that we that we um, uh, uh, that that we went into with the CDOT. And we actually had a virtual meeting launch on uh, Thursday, July 9th, that the chairman mentioned. Um, uh, in partnership with CDOT, uh, we, the FHWA administrator Nicole Nason, she she was on the call as long uh, along with Director Liu, myself, uh, Board Chair Dyack, um, we were all there to kick off this important program. Um, and again, the the program itself, you should have received some information about the program. Um, it's an opportunity for your communities. Uh, for infrastructure projects that transform urban spaces, especially for vulnerable users. Um, it's, a fo it's focused on arterial projects um, and try to alleviate the conflict points and it's all about safety. So we're, we're excited about this opportunity. Um, we think there's, there's great potential in this moving forward as does CDOT. So we're, we're very happy to be in partnership with CDOT on, on this initiative. And I would like to give a uh, big, big thanks to Ron Papstorf, our, our Transportation Planning and Operations Director, for all the work that he's done on this initiative and the coordination with, uh, with CDOT. So thank you, Ron, very much. Um, you should have received an email today about a workshop for next Thursday on July 23rd that will, is dedicated to this topic and just to kind of give you the, you know, with the criteria and some just of the rules of the game. So if you have any questions, please feel free anytime to reach out to myself or um, or, or Ron, and and uh, we'll get back to you in post haste. Um, city county managers meetings, uh, we've been holding these for the better part of a year and a half now, and um, I really would encourage you to reach out to your to your city town county manager and and um, invite him to these. And they are very highly productive meetings. They're great opportunities to share information and best practices. Our next meeting is scheduled virtually, of course, on August 13th. So if you'd like some additional information on that, um, please reach out. Um, but we will be, of course, in contact with each of your, your uh, city, county, and town managers. 
uh, small communities hot topics forum this is our annual forum for for our smaller communities in the region um, just 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 an FYI that we will be sending out a survey um, between now and the end of the month to, to uh, just get your thoughts on proposed topics and preferred dates for this year's event um, we anticipate again that this will be virtual but we uh, we, we didn't want it to, to go go by without having it um, uh, because we think it's, it's tremendously useful and we've gotten a great free feedback from our smaller communities and and uh, hopefully this year is no different. So stay tuned on that. Um, I'll give you a quick census update. Um, many of you know that Dr. Cog, we received a grant from DOLA to promote a complete count for the 2020 census. Specifically, it was focused on encouraging older adults in our region to respond. Uh, we just wrapped up our effort and are preparing the final report um, but according to the census folks, um, Dr. Cog counties are kind of leading the way in Colorado. We have six of our counties are in the top 10 leading the way is, uh, is Douglas County at 76.9%. So that's a pretty darn good return and, and uh, the others are, are uh, you know, uh, just on the heel. So that's, that's great. And we, I think um, hopefully that everybody is, is uh, understanding the importance to, to get that count up and uh, because it affects uh, uh, among other things, federal funding that we receive in this region. Let me see here. Um, well, the last thing I might mention, and I hope she's okay with doing this, um, it's, it's just, just a personal point of order. Uh, so Melinda Stevens, who has, has been uh, who, our, our transportation, our transportation planning and operations division assistant for, uh, for over a year or so now, um, she, as you know, has been kind of the voice of the Dr. Cog board meetings for quite some time. She's been coordinating the events and helping in the executive office in Connie's absence. And I'm happy to report and wanted to publicly congratulate her. She has been selected as uh, the new executive as, uh, assistant within the executive office. So uh, Melinda, we really appreciate all your efforts over the past seven plus months and doing some double duty. And uh, I'm really looking forward to to working with you um, in the uh, in, in your new role, she starts her new role on August third. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm done with my report. All right, thank you, Executive Director Rex and uh, Ms. Stevens. Again, uh, congratulations, and on behalf of uh, all the upcoming and and previous chairs, uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, it's an unsung job, and you make being a chair a whole lot easier. So thank you again, and congratulations. Um, next item, item six, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there will be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will be begin immediately after the last speaker. Uh, if you have public comment at this time, please raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will uh, call upon you. Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I'll go ahead and unmute all participants at this time. And first I'll ask if there's anyone on the phones. If you are on the phone, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone on the phones and I am not seeing any hands raised. All right, um, thank you. Uh, with no public comment, we will close public comment at 648. Uh, the next part of the agenda is the consent agenda. Item seven is approval of consent agenda. If there are any uh, questions or comments, uh, please uh, raise your hand now. Otherwise, raise your hand and I'm gonna entertain a motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like um, our first hand is from Elise Jones, Director Jones. Uh, well, she is unmuted and able to speak. Uh, Elise, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. I'm so sorry. Uh, would you like me to move on to the next person, Chair? Please. Okay, uh, looks like um uh, oh we need another hand okay looks like we have uh herb atchison director atchison go ahead move the consent agenda please thank you director atchison do we have a second uh it looks like we do from director teal go ahead second 
Thank you. We have a motion from Director Atchison, a uh, second from Director Teal. Uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, open the phone lines and we're going to vote on this thing. Okay, everyone. Let's see, I'll do one more time. All right, everyone should be able to speak. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next part of the agenda, the action items. Item eight, discussion of a technical amendment to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. So this will be the third time that you've seen this item in the last few months. We brought it to you in May as an informational item. Uh, we had it as a public hearing um, as part of our June board meeting. And then we're bringing it to you tonight for uh, asking you to take action on this. So I won't belabor the point, but I just want to make sure uh, that we all remember kind of what this is and what we're asking for. Um, as we are in the midst of our 2050 uh, regional transportation plan update, which we'll talk about in the next agenda item, uh, we weren't anticipating uh, doing another amendment to our 2040, our adopted 2040 plan, um, but in the course of routine coordination with E-470 Public Highway Authority, um, it came to light that this project that you should see on your screen, which is the uh, mainline widening, the sixth laning of E-470 uh, from Quincy up to I-70. Um, this project is in our 2040 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, but it's going to open sooner than was originally uh, sort of staged or envisioned in our in our adopted plan. So really all this amendment is, is really just a technical amendment um, to move this project up so that it's in the proper, uh, what we call air quality staging period for um, air quality conformity purposes. Uh, because that is a federal requirement and because we want to be transparent in our work, uh, we did follow our planning process on this amendment. Uh, we did have the 30-day public comment period. Um, as I mentioned, we had the public hearing uh, as part of the June board meeting. Um, as part of the 30-day public comment period, uh, we did receive some comments from Boulder County. Um, those are part of the record of this amendment. They are included in your agenda packet um, along with staff responses. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are asking you to um, actually approve a resolution that basically says that um, you are approving the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan as amended with this technical change. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Um, board members, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand or people on the phone, please uh, use star six. Uh, Ms. Stevens, are there any questions or comments, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question is from Roger Partridge, Director Partridge. Mr. Chair, I will move a motion. And if you choose to have discussion afterwards, we'll see. Move to approve the minute 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and associated Dr. Card, COG, carbon monoxide, and PM10 conformity determination in the Denver Southern sub area, eight hour ozone conformity determination. Thank you, Director Partridge. Uh, do we have a second, please? Uh, we do. It looks like our second is from uh, Catherine Whitman, Director Whitman. And I will second that. Thank you very much. Um, just one last call for any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I will call for a vote. Ms. Stevens? Okay, I am not seeing any hands raised at this time. Thank you very much. Um, please open the phone lines and we'll vote. Okay, we are good to go. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yes? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Next item, item nine, discussion of the project solicitation and evaluation process for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I have a presentation for this one, so we're gonna share my screen. Give us just a second to do that. Okay, can folks see can folks see the presentation on my screen? We can see the presentation. Okay. Trying to get it in 
presentation mode. So bear with me just a second here. Just like a printer always acts up when it needs to print. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's switch gears and talk about our 2050 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Just a reminder here, um, this is our major plan update that we do every four years. Uh, we are in the midst of this process. Um, you all remember the scenario analysis that uh, we worked on for some time and showed you those results. Now as we're moving forward, we're getting into uh, specifically what we're calling project solicitation uh, and evaluation. Um, so let me start here first by, um, you see the list of meetings uh, on this slide. Um, this has been a very collaborative process to bring uh, the information that we're bringing to you tonight to ask you to approve. Uh, in particular, I want to thank um, all the local government staff and the others who are on our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, you see that there were a lot of meetings that we worked together collaboratively to get to this point. This is really your staff, um, all of you that helped contribute to this process, and they've made it uh, a better process, so we really appreciate that. Um, so TAC has approved this. Um, RTC considered this yesterday and also approved this. Um, what we're actually asking you to approve and what I'm going to present on tonight um, is a couple of elements of this, but uh, the list that you see at the bottom of the slide, but essentially it's being transparent about what is our planning process, how are we going to make decisions, what types of projects are we soliciting, and how are we going to evaluate those projects to prepare uh, the 2015 really fiscally constrained but MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, first thing is our planning framework. Uh, what this slide is communicating is all the various uh, plans that both Dr. Cog, uh, local governments, and our planning partners at CDOT and RTD um, have been working on or completed over the last few years. Um, a lot of great planning work by all of the agencies, uh, really important planning work that together really sets the vision and I think the needs for this region. Um, through this cumulative planning work, we, you know, we kind of know what our vision is. Uh, we know what our needs are. We have a sense of what our priorities are. Um, so we want to use this work as a foundation um, as we go forward to prepare the 2050 plan. Um, this slide, um, in terms of uh, how we prepare the plan, an important point on this slide is um, there's many ways that we convey regional priorities within our regional transportation plan. Tonight, we're going to talk about one of those ways, which is specific kind of major projects, those major sort of multimodal capacity projects that we include in the plan. And that's certainly an important way in which we, which we uh, convey um, investment priorities, obviously. But there are other ways that we do that, too. The plan is, is multifaceted multi-layered in the sense that um, we, also, we also show project categories and some, some categories we may not have specific projects, like say maintenance or operations or other, other um, investments in the regional transportation system. Uh, but those categories, those types of projects are very important. So we include those as well. Uh, we have a financial plan or we'll have a financial plan. So the investment allocations that we'll together make in that financial plan is obviously another way that we convey priorities. Um, and even the narrative content of the plan, uh, the things that we emphasize, the things that we focus on in the plan is obviously another way in which we convey investment priorities. So tonight we're gonna talk about um, specific projects, the major projects that we're interested in in the solicitation uh, and evaluation of those projects. And then other elements we will work through together um, in the process that I will show you in the next few slides. Um, one, as we, get, as we get into 2050 and thinking back to the last agenda item on the 2040 plan, one question is how we transition uh, those projects that are currently in our adopted 2040 plan, how do they transition over to 2050? So there's a little bit that goes into this. I won't get into the weeds too much, but essentially uh, we either look at projects that will be complete by the time this plan is adopted is one category. Uh, the second category is projects that are really on their way in the project development process and the federal NEPA process. Those projects we're going to pull over automatically. So in other words, for project sponsors who have spent years, you know, developing this project, um, getting into that federal NEPA process or having that NEPA process funded, um, you know, we're not going to pull the rug out from under those projects. Those are solid investments. We're going to bring those projects forward into the new plan. And then finally, the projects that we're interested in, in terms of the solicitation, is um, projects that are not yet to the NEPA stage. Um, maybe there's still a concept, maybe there's been a corridor or a PEL study. Those are the types of projects that we're interested in. Other projects that kind of remain from our 2040 plan, uh, for which ha you know, they haven't moved forward um, just yet, you know, those projects we're interested in. And then we're also interested in um, projects in our 2040 plan that were shown as locally funded, you know, maybe some of those are really, really good projects and the project sponsor maybe wants to have that 
um, sort of part of the solicitation for uh, federal, state, and regional funding as part of the 2050 plan. I'm going to come back to this concept in a couple slides, so um, so hold on to this concept as we move forward. Um, we worked out a framework. This is what we spent a lot of time with our transportation advisory committee and our planning partners. You know, there's a lot of groups that that we coordinate with. This is really this really is the region's plan. This isn't just Dr. Cog's plan, but you know, RTD, CDOT, uh, local governments, our other stakeholders are all really important. So we wanted to kind of devise a process that recognizes um, and works with each of those entities. So this is a little bit flowcharty, but basically what this process is conveying is that uh, we're going to be on a dual track. One of those tracks is Dr. Cog working specifically with CDOT and RTD, um, and I'll come to that in the next slide. The other track is Dr. Cog working with uh, the sub-regional forums, the county transportation forums, to hear what your priorities are and to bring that into the process. So we want to hear kind of information and input from both tracks, and then we'll work together with everyone in the interagency coordination process to create the draft uh, program and project investment priorities. At the same time, I mentioned that we're working on the financial plan for 2015. Uh, so that's obviously a huge consideration as well as, you know, what revenues uh, will we be able to bring to the table, federal, state, local, and other revenues? Uh, what, will be, what will we be able to fund in this transportation plan? So we bring all of that together to create uh, our draft priorities, work with our committees, work with you as our board to kind of work through that. And then at the bottom of the slide, end up with our final uh, program and project investment priorities. Um, this slide is really just to drill down a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, on the dual, dual track process. And the point I'd make here is that we want to hear directly from the, from the county transportation forums. Um, and as several of you know, we've already started reaching out uh, to you all to get that process, uh, get that process underway. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but we also um, we also want to coordinate with our planning partners at CDOT and RTD. Uh, we recognize that both CDOT and RTD have their funds that they control. They have their projects that they've been working on. Uh, we want to honor the work that they've done in their planning processes uh, and bring that into our 2050 planning process. So we're going to work with both both sets of groups together um, in a coordinated way to bring this all together for the 2050 plan. Um, Speaking specifically of the uh, county sub-regional transportation forums, um, this slide shows the number of candidate project submittals um, that we worked through with our transportation advisory committee. Uh, we wanted kind of a process here. There's some math behind this, um, but essentially it's, you know, sort of each county's proportion of the entire region. Um, we, we all thought that was kind of the fairest way to do this. I'd make a couple of points here. One is that, as it says over on the right, these are candidate projects that we're evaluating. Um, so this is, I'll say this a couple of times in the presentation, this is a long range plan. This is not the tip. Uh, we're not applying for specific projects at this time, but we do, as I said, want to hear from each county uh, from your forms, transportation priorities. Um, our final plan, given our financial resources, probably isn't going to include uh, nearly this number of projects at the end of the day. Um, but having said that, uh, remember the other slide, there are many projects that we're bringing over from the 2040 plan. As we work with CDOT and RTD, we'll be bringing their projects forward as well. Um, another element to this that we know that we all care about and that you care about is equity. Um, so we wanted to be thoughtful of that in terms of working with every single county transportation form. And I'll talk about uh, evaluation in, in a slide or two, um, but our evaluation committee is also structured to make sure that everyone that we're working with in this process will have a voice at the table in terms of how we evaluate and how we select these projects. Um, so in fact, the evaluation process, um, part of this, what we're bringing to you tonight to ask you to approve um, includes an evaluation committee that would be made up of Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, and representatives from every single county transportation forum. Again, we're all in this together. We're gonna create this plan together. We should all have a voice about how we're, how we're evaluating and selecting projects. We are proposing for these major candidate projects that we will do a um, qualitative evaluation. Uh, we'll do that qualitative evaluation against a couple metrics. One is the primary objectives in our Metro Vision Plan. Um, I'll show those to you in a slide or two, but those are very, I think, pretty straightforward, you know, expression of the region's priorities, but flexible enough to allow project sponsors um, some space and opportunity to be able to respond to those. And then we also have a federal requirement from the FAST Act, the Surface Transportation Act, there's some performance measures from the FAST Act that were required uh, to include in this evaluation process. The good news is that those two things overlap um, um, to, a, to a great extent. 
Um, and so we're going to combine those together to streamline uh, what we're asking for from project sponsors and from the forums um, in submitting these projects. We're not intending to make this a laborious, again, this is not the TIP. Um, this is a long range transportation plan, 30 year plan. Um, so we're going to streamline this as much as possible uh, for the counties and for the project sponsors. Um, here's the Metro Vision Plan objectives. I'm not going to go through these um, in detail. Uh, I think the point here is that in working with the Transportation Advisory Committee, again, we wanted to find the right level of something specific enough that really conveyed the region's priorities and what's important to us in terms of how we should be evaluating these projects. But as I said, flexible enough that, um, that there's some maneuverability in terms of giving folks opportunity to respond to these. Um, this slide also shows kind of our first a first best guess on how we would do that qualitative evaluation. Some of these lend themselves to kind of a yes, no. Some of these lend themselves to something more like a high, medium, low, uh, one, two, three, four type of evaluation. And then finally, um, our schedule on this, it is a little bit of an aggressive schedule, um, but several of the forums are already starting to put a process in place and we really appreciate that. Uh, we are here as Dr. Cog's staff. I am here to help all of you kind of navigate through this. I'm not gonna go through every point in the schedule, but the bottom line here is that we have a federal deadline um, that the federal, um, our federal partners, FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration need to both review and certify this 2050 plan by June of 2021. So we need to adopt it. We're aiming for April of 2021 to adopt, uh, to give them time to do that. When you step backwards to the schedule, really the critical path for us is that we wanna get through this process that I've outlined and bring candidate project uh, selection, really sort of the networks that would include uh, those candidate major projects to TAC in September um, and to you and to RTC in October to approve those networks so that we can uh, conduct air quality conformity modeling um, and finish putting the plan together. So with that, we are asking you to approve the proposed uh, 2050 MBRTP uh, candidate project solicitation and evaluation process that I've covered here tonight and is articulated specifically in attachments one and two in the agenda packet. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Um, board members, if you have questions, please raise your, raise your virtual hand or hit star six and Ms. Stevens will call on you. Ms. Stevens, the floor is yours for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give everyone just a moment in case there's any questions or comments on this topic. Okay, as I'm going through the list, I do not see any hands raised. Great, uh, with no further questions or comments, I would uh, entertain a motion. If you are so inclined, please raise your hand or press star six. Okay, it looks like we have um, a hand raise from Director Jones. Go ahead, Director Jones. Uh, it looks, yep. Okay, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yay, I move that we approve the proposed 2050 MVRTP candidate project, project solicitation and evaluation process and criteria as documented. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, do we have a second? Uh, we do. It looks like we have a second from uh, Tammy Mauer. Director Mauer, go ahead. Uh, it looks like you are self-muted. You'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Um, second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Great. Uh, we, have, we have a motion from Director Jones, a second from Director Maurer. Uh, Ms. Stevens, can you please open the phone line so we can take a vote? Absolutely. Okay. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves and make a verbal vote. All right. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, that concludes the action items. Uh, on to the next section, informational briefings. Uh, item 10, COVID-19 impacts to the Dr. Cog Ombudsman Program. Ms. Gimbel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Thank you. My name is Shannon Gimbel. I am the manager for Dr. Cog's long-term care and PACE Ombudsman program. Um, and so tonight I wanted to give you a brief update about what we've been seeing and what's been happening in our communities 
And, and now when I say communities, I say facilities, communities, and homes interchangeably. It, it depends on the audience. And so I try to be careful with saying the word facility, but if it if it slips out, just know if I'm saying communities, homes, I'm also talking about long-term care facilities. Just to give you guys an overview of what's what's been happening since, since COVID has taken place. And I don't want to assume that everybody um, in attendance knows exactly what we do. So I want to just give a, a very quick snippet of what the Ombudsman program does. We're a federally mandated program um, that is there to act as advocates on behalf of residents residing in long-term care, but we're also complaint investigators. And then the PACE program, which is a relatively newer program, we work with those who are participating in um, program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. And in our region, that is Innovage who provides that service and so mostly in those settings we're working with folks living in their homes um, and then obviously they have contracted long-term care homes that they they work with as well um, and so typically what ombudsmen do is go into the facilities and meet with the residents and find out what the concerns are and then try to advocate on behalf of what it is that their wishes are or if they have a decision maker um, we will work on their behalf as well Anybody can contact us, um, but typically most of our contacts come with going into the homes and, and laying eyes on folks and observing uh, care as well as the environment. And with COVID, that has been um, all, that has all come to a halt. Um, in Dr. Cog's region, we have, that the, that the AAA covers, we have, I had to run the numbers because they change continually. We have 503 long-term care homes. So that's homes licensed as nursing homes or assisted livings. We have 96 of those that are nursing homes and 407 of those are assisted livings. And so there's there's a pretty pretty uh, stark change in the numbers when you're looking at assisted living versus, versus nursing home. And so typically what we would do is we go into nursing homes at least monthly and then assisted livings quarterly. And that is just because of the amount of of um, facilities that we have to cover. There's no way we could go into all the assisted living homes uh, monthly like we do the nursing homes. Um, as of last week, CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which is who regulates um, and licenses these homes, puts out weekly information on COVID. That data rolls out on Wednesdays end of day, unfortunately, they are having some system issues and I wasn't able to get the most current data. Um, so the data I'm gonna be sharing with you is from last week, uh, last Wednesday. Um, as of last Wednesday, we have 113 homes that have a COVID outbreak in Dr. Cog's AAA region. The good news is of those 113 homes is that only 40 of those are considered active, which means um, they're still considered having an active outbreak. Um, there's strict criteria that CDPHE, as well as the CDC has uh, in, in place to determine whether a home is considered resolved. And that's typically at least 28 days with no additional new cases. So that is, that is the good news. Um, I know it's been in the media a lot that those long-term care homes were essentially on fire there for a while with non-stop cases of COVID. Um, and, and the death toll has been pretty staggering. Thus far in, in Dr. Cog's region, we have 513 deaths in long-term care that are lab confirmed COVID deaths. And then we have 121 that are presumptive. Um, they can't confirm that that was the cause of death, but they are presuming it is the cause of death. So the, the death toll has been pretty high for, for our residents, but it seems as if we've gotten um, some controls in place through the local health departments, as well as CDPHE, and it, it seems to be at least slowing down. But with that is coming um, a fair amount of um, severe isolation. And, and that's what you're now gonna be seeing in the media is is these residents since uh, March 15th, I believe is when, I believe is when everything went on lockdown for these, these homes. So there's no communal activities, there's no communal dining, um, residents being are asked to, they're being asked to stay isolated in their rooms, uh, no in-person visits. We are trying to make virtual calls, we're trying to reach out 
uh, to individuals either through Skype or FaceTime or on the phone. That being said, it's a very difficult task when you're talking about somebody who has limited capacity, limited hearing. You have folks with dementia who don't understand what's happening at all, let alone how somebody's talking to them, to them through a, an electronic device. And so it's been a real struggle for these folks to have um, such severe isolation, especially with folks who don't understand why. And so now those are the calls that we are getting is from families and residents. I mean, we're going on now five, five months with these folks not being able to see their loved ones um, and not being able to uh, leave their rooms in essence. So it's, it's something that our office is working on. Uh, I do a lot of work with CDPHE as well as healthcare policy and finance to come up with guidelines for folks to be able to reconnect with loved ones. Um, there was outdoor visitation guidelines that were recently rolled out about two weeks ago. And so that is now something that homes that do not have an active outbreak are eligible to do. However, we do have communities that uh, are facilities that are not willing to do that. And so certainly our, our struggle comes in advocating for that to be something that can happen and be done so safely um, because because our residents and families are, are fairly distraught. We're hearing a lot of stories about weight loss, um, about failure to thrive. Um, just just the, the isolation has become pretty significant for these individuals where they are failing now um, physically as well as emotionally because of, because of the isolation and not being able to see their loved ones. Um, so we have compiled, I've been looking at data as far as what our complaints have been looking like since this went into place. Um, the ombudsman are still getting plenty of calls. We're making daily calls. We're calling the facilities on a regular basis. We're reaching out to resident council presidents. We're doing um, virtual uh, town hall meetings, if you will, with some of these homes when it's able to be set up. Um, so we are certainly still getting plenty of plenty of calls from residents and families about the concerns. Um, but I did have us pull data as far as what are top five complaints that we're dealing with right now. Um, and number one is discharge. Unfortunately, um, discharges are still happening in the middle of a pandemic. Um, a lot of these discharges are, discharges are happening because residents are not being, as the facilities say, compliant. Um, with the severe isolation, we have we have residents who want to leave. They're going out, then they're they're choosing not to self quarantine, or they're not going to be compliant with mask orders, etc. So facilities are taking that as an opportunity to discharge these individuals. Discharge is very difficult to do in a pandemic because there is no safe place for these individuals to go, um, and and so it's been it's been quite the challenge on our end to try to keep people off the streets and housed while also understanding that they're putting other residents at risk. Um, resident rights is the second, the second complaint we're dealing with. Lack of care is the third. Uh, facility not addressing concerns is number four, and number five is staffing. There has been a significant staff staffing shortage in these homes prior to COVID. Um, and when COVID hit, we literally had people walking off the job or not showing up for shift shifts. So we had um, a, a pretty good downfall before, but now certainly it's getting even, even worse because you have very few people who are willing to put themselves in a position to be exposed and the work is extremely difficult. Um, so there is conversations about Ombudsman, as well as Adult Protective Services, re-entering into these settings because right now the Ombudsman and APS, Adult Protective Services, are not going in. Um, and that's something that we have to be very mindful and careful about how we, we approach it. Um, when we go into five different homes, uh, I will not have it be on our hands that we are the reason that COVID came into somebody's home because we were in a home where there was an outbreak or we were in a home where we didn't know that somebody was positive. Um, and so we're working closely with the health department as well as the state ombudsman's office. There was a national work group um, that the state ombudsman here in, in Colorado was part of to develop reentry policy and procedures. And, and policy and procedures really need to be in place in order to protect the program, but also to protect the residents. 
Um, that those guidelines have been put out and it is now with the administration for community living which is the federal level for review and then it'll go to the cdc for um, additional input there's a lot to be taken in consideration what kind of ppe is going to be needed and we go to one more to more than one home in a day i mean oftentimes my ombudsman will do five or six visits in a day if they're smaller homes what will that look like um what happens if we find there was an outbreak after we do a visit there, there's a lot of things to take into consideration and so once the cdc makes the recommendations then it'll come back to the states and it'll be vetted by the local programs which is what dr cog is we're one of the local programs we're the largest in the state um, as well as the state unit on aging and i would imagine um it's kind of hard to to wrap my head around what this policy procedure might look like but i would imagine that it will look different within our own program based on the county we're going into. Um, you know, Arapahoe County right now and Denver County are, are our highest hit uh, counties with regards to, to positive homes in, um, in long-term care. And so certainly we're gonna be looking to local health departments to help us decide what's going to make sense. You know, us doing a, a visit in Arapahoe County is going to look very different than us doing a visit in Broomfield County, where we um, only have two homes. So it, I wouldn't imagine that one, one size is going to fit all. It's going to be something that's um, fluid and, and changing and um, something that we're just going to have to be really patient with in, in getting back out there. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I will open it up if there's any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gimbel. Um, Board members, if there are any questions, please re raise your virtual hand or use star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, the floor is yours for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question is from uh, Tammy Maurer, Director Maurer, go ahead. Um, I didn't have a question, my hand just was up, sorry. Oh. Thank you though. <laughs> no problem, uh, then I will move on to the next. Uh, it looks like our, Next question or comment is from uh, Steve Conklin, Director Conklin. Thank you very much, and this isn't as much of a, as a, of a question as it is a comment. Shannon, thank you to you and your staff for all that you do. Uh, I mean, you do do amazing things, and it is obviously a challenge nowadays. My dad was in long-term care for two and a half years up until his death in May, and what a tough time for families to, to not be able to see folks and, and also a tough time for the, the patients. And I think the other part of the challenge is as family we were along with you folks holding the the nursing facility accountable <laughs> and that accountability without you going in without as much hospice staff as as previously had been able to go in without family going in the ability to hold the facility accountable is is really challenging and i think that that many of them do a a phenomenal job but i also think that these challenging times, not having those eyes on what's going on is is obviously a challenge. So uh, I, I wish you the best. I, I hope that you're able to, to work out ways to, to get in and, and help the residents by being there and, and seeing them, but also holding the facilities accountable, which I think right now there's, there's kind of a, a piece of that that's lacking. But again, thank mm -hmm. you to you and your staff for all that you do. Thank you, and 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 we agree. It, it is absolutely heart wrenching for myself and and the team who are so used to being able to go in and lay eyes on folks and work with them, um, and to to try to do it virtually is in, incredibly difficult. And and you are absolutely right. The accountability piece um, is very difficult right now. Um, and and I assure you, we will get back out there, and and we will fix what has been broken during this time. It's just going to it's going to be a long haul for us to get back out there. But I appreciate the comments. Thank you. All right, thank you, and thank you, Director Conklin. Um, and at this point, I am not seeing any other hands raised, so I will turn it back to our chair. Great, um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gimble. Thank you for all you do again. Um, uh, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for uh, creating some awareness here to the Dr. Cog board. We appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. Next item, item 11, 2020-2023 uh, Transportation Improvement Program COVID-19 Impacts. Mr. Papstorf.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. I'd like to thank whoever put the agenda together for putting me behind Shannon. It was heart-wrenching and horrible, and um, but I'll do my best to carry on here. I do have a brief presentation to speak uh, this evening a little bit about um, impacts that we are um, experiencing uh, financially and procedurally as a result of the um, uh, current uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic um, and potential impacts and strategies for dealing with those impacts in relation to uh, funded and programmed projects in the 2020 through 2023 um, uh, Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you see my screen? Um, I can see your screen, but it is it is dark right now at the moment. I do not see slides. Well, let me try to get started again. You may need to regress to uh, Director Stolzman's. Um, <laughs> I know troubleshooting from yesterday. Yes, indeed. Take it you cannot you still cannot see my screen. I cannot. Looks like a nice black hole, Ron. That's, well, it's kind of how my how my life feels right now. So <laughs> <laughs> Melinda, this is oh Melinda or Lisa, I I don't know if we can just pull up the PDF or something and Ron can go off of that. Sure, let me see if I can pull it up quickly. can see it. Okay. Did we get it? Well, we hope so. <laughs> the screen advance, that's the second that, chance. Yep, that seems to be working. All right, perfect. There we go. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, um, I don't need to tell all of you about the um, impacts of uh, at the local level, at the state level, at the regional level of uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, I think we, we know for sure that the full impacts are still very uncertain. It's a very fluid situation. Uh, at the state level, the forecasts are moving around. Um, the, you know, most of the most common uh, local transportation funds are being impacted one way or the other. Um, sales taxes, property taxes, sometimes to a little bit lesser extent because they can be a lagging impact, uh, uh, lagging indicator, uh, use taxes, uh, the state, the, the city and county share of state highway user tax fund revenues is being impacted because the state gas tax revenue is being impacted. Um, those estimates are, are changing. As a matter of fact, uh, the, mo the more recent um, estimates from CDOT are, would probably double this $13 million figure over the, over the next three years for um, city and county um, jurisdictions within the Dr. Cog region. It's probably more like $25 to $30 million cumulative impact to all cities and counties within the Dr. Cog region over the next three years, um, looking like maybe a 3% uh, reduction from um, uh, budgeted or um, forecast revenues for this current uh, 2019 to 2020 um, fiscal year, um, because the COVID, you know, the impact started well into the state fiscal year, uh, but about an 8% reduction in 2021. So you you kind of accumulate those um, together and it can be a significant impact. Um, obviously, um, the overall financial impacts are, are vary, varying from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, and uh, some agencies that are feeling um, the, the financial hits harder than others are, are expressing some difficulty in uh, perhaps implementing um, currently programmed transportation projects around the region. Uh, there have been other impacts besides financial impacts. 
uh, that include there were early court closures in the first month or two of um, the pandemic as uh, courts were shut down and, and everything was shut down. Uh, that had some impact on, say, right-of-way actions um, and um, uh, acquiring right-of-way for projects. There have been delays because of just adapting to remote work processes, um, getting new processes set up so that documents could be traded back and forth and, and executed and signed electronically. Um, there have been, in some jurisdictions, staff reductions that are slowing down processes. Utilities have been slower to, to get out and do work. So all of those impacts are um, starting, starting to accumulate to, to some projects. Um, just by way of reminder, you know, we, we program, we just adopted this latest transportation improvement program last August, covering the four years from 2020 through 2023. Um, federal funds awarded through the Dr. Cog tip process generally require a minimum non-federal share of a little over 17%. Uh, percent. There are some exceptions to that, um, but that's generally true for most of the federal funds that get allocated through Dr. Cog. Um, as part of your adopted policy for, for putting together that tip, um, we, you established a 20% minimum local match for, for federal funds. And then under the state's multimodal options fund program, uh, the state required a 50% uh, minimum local match for those funds. So uh, together that represents um, over the four years of the tip, um, a little over um, you know, 200 and almost 245, 246 million dollars of committed local funds to match the, the combined federal funds and state multimodal options funds um, over that four years. So there has been a strong commitment by all of your jurisdictions as um, sponsors for uh, program TIP projects to actually leverage those federal and state funds. To the extent that those are starting to, uh, starting to be impacted and the ability of local jurisdictions to actually deliver on those commitments uh, for those local funds to, to leverage the federal and state funds. Uh, we want to have a discussion about how we deal with those situations. We've had a couple of conversations with the Transportation Advisory Committee. We, we spoke to the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday morning. Um, I think there are a couple of sort of procedural issues that we can, um, that we can pursue related to the TIP delay policy. Uh, so one option would be to waive or extend uh, the project delay penalties extend the cure period for project sponsors based on a demonstrated hardship, a, a process impact uh, that impacted uh, the ability to, for a local sponsor to actually meet uh, the programmed project deadline. Um, policy question about how long should we extend that cure period? Uh, what kind of uh, documentation for demonstrating that hardship? Uh, you know, if it's a financial hardship or a process hardship, um, and and how much latitude should we should we take? Should we fully waive sort of this year's delay and sort of you know uh, write off this year and basically we want to see every we want to see as many projects proceed as possible, but knowing that there have been some some impacts for those projects, those sponsors that can demonstrate those hardships, do we basically give them the year extension or do we give a six year extension beyond our normal? delay. So that's, that's, a, that's a point of discussion. Uh, the, second, the second strategy would be to allow project sponsors to request a reprogramming of the federal or state funds that they, that they have programmed in the TIP to another year, again, based on a demonstrated hardship. So if, they're, if their project was programmed for next year and they're being hit especially hard uh, financially or because of a process related to implementing the project, uh, and progressing that project, uh, do we allow them to ask to formally reprogram the funds for that project to a later year? That would allow us to um, kind of free up uh, programmed funds for other projects, for other sponsors that maybe have an opportunity, haven't been hit as hard, or have other resources, have a project that's ready to bring to bring forward and kind of take that slot, if you will, in the in the four-year tip, so that we again, meet our goal of trying to invest as many of these federal funds and state funds that we know we'll have available out to projects, out to important transportation projects, invested in the economy, hiring hiring construction workers and, and contractors and so forth um, to kind of help us through the economic recovery while also investing in important projects around the region. 
And then the, the third conversation we've had um, as a result of um, significant efforts on the part of CDOT are to um, look at the option of allowing the use of toll credits, state toll credits, to backfill um, some or all of a, um, a project sponsor's local match requirement. Uh, that would allow sponsors to utilize state toll credits as the non-federal match, again, based on a demonstrated financial hardship uh, for that uh, sponsor, for that project sponsor. Um, I don't want to get into the details of toll credits, but they, they accumulate at the state level based on implementation of toll back, toll funded projects. Um, it is a federal tool that's allowed um, so that toll credits can be used to meet the non-federal match for um, federal transportation funding. Um, the state has accumulated over the years approximately um, $800 million or so of toll credits across Colorado. Um, we understand that CDOT has um, a need for a, a portion of those uh, for um, some one or more CDOT projects to leverage some federal funds, but CDOT is basically promoting and allowing the utilization of the remaining toll credits um, under an application process by local project sponsors that have uh, federally funded projects. Um, but are requesting that sort of those local requests that happen within metropolitan planning organizations like Dr. Cog to kind of come through uh, the MPO for uh, review before the state approves the use of those toll credits. And it does get a little complicated um, because toll credits are applied again as the non-federal match uh, in order to reduce non-federal funds, but it doesn't provide project funding. Um, you, can't, you can't pay a contractor with toll credits. Um, you can only pay a contractor with actual cash dollars. And so while this, um, this allows you to 100% federally fund a project by um, uh, substituting toll credits for the non-federal cash match that um, local government sponsors typically come to a federal, bring to a federally funded project, um, it doesn't increase the actual amount of money available to the project. So if you, know, if you have a $1 million project um, programmed and approved in the TIP that had $800,000 of federal funding and $200,000 of local non-federal funds. If you replace that $200,000 of non-federal funds with $200,000 of toll credits to make the project 100% federally funded, you really only have $800,000 to implement that project. So the two options available are to reduce the project scope by shaving some phase of the project, some portion of the project off of the scope uh, to reduce down to the actual uh, federal funding that's available, in this case, $800,000, or increase federal funds to the project. Um, to So in this case, you would bring another $200,000 of federal funds to the project to have a $1 million project fully funded with a hundred with a million dollars of federal funds matched by the toll credits. So those are kind of the two ways you can you can get at that. The policy issues for you all to consider are: um, should we, in certain cases, allow scope reductions? Our our tip policy basically does not allow for scope reductions. You all award federal funds through the tip to a project with the expectation of each other that the project sponsor will deliver that project with the funds that were allocated through the through the tip pro, through the tip competitive process um, in you know kind of the typical experience we see is that you know sometimes a project cost will increase uh, before the project is implemented and the the full expectation um, that we all have is that that project sponsor finds a way to come up with additional funding to cover that increased cost not through additional tip dollars. So that would kind of allowing a scope reduction to fit within um, a reduced um, project cost to leverage with toll credits uh, would be a policy decision that we would need to make. The second, the second policy issue um, would be about allowing uh, or allocating unprogrammed federal funds. In this case, we've got approximately $13 million or so of unprogrammed federal funds in the tip. We were prepared to go through the waitlist process, as you all uh, will recall, um, to start to 
work with all of the subregions and the regional wait lists and start allocating uh, those portions of this on-program federal funds to wait list projects. I think the, the, the uh, question before you is, do we want to um, instead allow for allocating portions or all of that those on-program federal funds to reduce non-federal match to help utilize um, toll credits for project sponsors that are that are having difficulty um, proceeding with a currently programmed federally funded project. So for discussion this evening, I kind of wanted to just put this information out to you, have, have a chance for you to ask questions and, and discuss um, before staff sort of works with TAC to formulate a formal proposal to bring back uh, to the board and the RTC for consideration uh, later this summer. Um, so the discussion points again are um, what's the level of interest in allowing scope reductions uh, for project sponsors on, under a hardship condition in order to utilize toll credits. Um, it does reduce the overall investment in regional transportation projects, but it may for certain projects allow us to make sure that we are at least spending the federal dollars that we do have. And then a related question is, what do we do with the scope reduction? Does it, does it uh, does the unfunded portion of that project then go to the top of the waiting list uh, or does it go to the bottom of the wait list or does it just have does it get completely deferred and the project sponsor would have to compete through the next tip process to to fund that that un, that now unfunded portion of the project uh, the second discussion is related to allocating on program federal funds to reduce the non-federal match uh, related to utilizing toll credits again this relieves financial pressure on local agency budgets. It does maintain um, as much uh, regional investment as possible. Um, it does eliminate or reduce the ability to fund uh, currently uh, kind of current TIP waitlist projects in the currently adopted TIP. We'll say that based on our conversations with your staff and other stakeholders um, at TAC, um, we are kind of operating under a concept that we would we would suggest to you might be one way to do this would be to allow discussion through the subregional forums, recognizing that jurisdictions and, and uh, are being affected in different ways um, around the region uh, for for local project sponsors, and that kind of allowing that discussion to happen at the subregional forums for them to decide and make recommendations uh, to bring forward to RTC and the board might be the best way to approach this. Uh, because there may be some subregions where, you know, most of the jurisdictions aren't being affected in such a way that, you know, they can't continue with the projects they have currently programmed, and they would like to use sort of their share of the unprogrammed federal funds to implement uh, one or more waitlist projects. There might be other jurisdictions in another subregion that are being hit really hard. They have a really important project, and this and the subregion might agree that it, it it's important enough that they'd be willing to allocate. A portion or all of the unprogrammed federal funds in the subregion to that project in order to allow the project sponsor to utilize toll credits to keep that project moving forward. Um, so at least our working our working theory at this point is that as a concept that might be the best way to um, have those conversations, have more direct conversations with local sponsors at the subregional level. Um, and formulate recommendations, recognizing the differences among jurisdictions uh, back forward to Dr. Cog through the RTC and the board. So with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions and um, have any discussion that the board um, feels is appropriate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Board members, um, any, any discussion on uh, using the sub-regional forms to go through some of these issues, scope reductions or Discussing the unprogrammed federal funds to reduce the non-federal match. Please uh, raise your hand or use star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn over to for discussion and questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and it looks like we do have a few questions and comments. Would you like me to just field these with Mr. Papsdorf? Please. Okay. All right, then we will start. Uh, it looks like our first question is from uh, George Teal. Director Teal, go ahead. Thank you. Um, not a not a question. I think uh, Ron did a good job of the presentation. Um, I, I do think that the um, the concept is sound. 
to allow discussion through the sub-regional forums that then can come back to recommendations to the RTC and the board. I think that's a good way to go. Um, I think it is uh, accurate to say. We do have differences in the fiscal impact of COVID from community to community. Um, and uh, I think the sub-regional forum is the place to um, gain those comments and bring them back to the board. All right, thank you for your comment, Director Teal. It looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Herb Atchison. Director Atchison, go ahead. Thank you. A couple of questions and, and maybe a comment as well. I guess, do we have an indication already that we have projects that are in trouble that are a part of the 2020-23 TIP cycle? Um, Director Atchison, Ron Papsgrove here. Uh, yeah, we've been a, we ha staff has been approached by um, oh a handful of jurisdictions so far, um, uh, six to ten that are expressing some concerns about um, ability to um, proceed with a project on the current schedule. Okay, that's that's fine. The other one is uh, unless somebody's got a magic bullet or a magic glass. We don't know what the impacts are, and we won't know for our our annual budgets probably for several months because it's still accumulating. I know that I'm going to have an impact, but I can't tell you today how much. But I I do agree that I think the best way for us to deal with this, as George pointed out, is until we know what our real impacts are, and until each member of the sub-region has gone in and said to that group, I need to make a change. I think we need to let it go to the sub-regional groups and then come back with our recommendation on the projects that are specifically identified within our region and then look at how we could shift that potential dollars if we can and then let the other let those groups make the decision on the toll dollars that might be available to help match some of this, but I would imagine most people are going to try to figure out a way to find funding if they can. If not, I don't think most of us who put in projects are going to want to give pieces of the project in there because we were dependent upon those whole projects getting done. In my case, I've already awarded contracts getting ready to start the one that we, we got approved as a joint venture between Adams and Jefferson County. So we, we are going to go forward one way or another, but I, not everybody's going to be in that situation, as George pointed out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comments, Director Atchison. <clears throat> okay, it looks like our next question or comment is from Nicholas Williams. Director Williams, go ahead. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Ron, can you talk a little bit about the process for kind of distributing, uh, I imagine would uh, on the total development credits, uh, distributing and just, I, I assume there's a finite amount of these credits at this point. Yeah, uh, thank you, Director Williams. Um, I, I believe that Rebecca White's on the on the call this evening from CDOT, so she might be able to shed a little bit more light on that. Um, there is a finite amount of toll credits that have accumulated to to Colorado so far. Like I said, I believe it's in the range of about eight hundred million dollars. My understanding um, from CDOT most recently was they were anticipating retaining less than $100 million, million of that uh, for their use uh, for CDOT projects. Um, and we're making available sort of on a first come, first, first serve basis around the state from local project sponsors for federally funded projects to approach to um, ask CDOT to utilize a portion of those state toll credits on those locally sponsored projects. Um, as of last Friday, I believe that CDOT had received nine requests around the state to utilize toll credits. I think that's correct. Um, Rebecca, if you're if if you're still on the meeting, if you have additional information or want to correct me if I got anything wrong there. Hi, Ron. I'm I'm still here, and I I think you have it correct. Thank you. That's it. These are uh, and sort of an odd creature toll credits. Uh, first time we have actually done this, but we're very happy to be able to provide these, and we have uh, a lot. Um, you know, 800 million total, and and CDOT doesn't need to retain too many of those. 
Um, so we're sort of in the early stages of this process and we'll see how this goes. Um, but I, hopefully they will, there will be enough for the, the local governments that need to use these. Thank you. Director Williams, did that get to your, did that answer your question? It, it did. I guess just one kind of quick follow up. So would these ultimately be administered through CDOT or or through Dr. Cog or allocated through via CDOT or Dr. Cog? Thank you for the clarifying question, um, Director Williams. It's really important. So the the toll credits are administered and would be allocated through CDOT. CDOT will CDOT will kind of handle the administrative side of that. Um, and when they when they sort of put out the call statewide to this, um, they indi they indicated, um, um, and I, which I very much appreciate, sort of for for projects awarded through an MPO tip process, um, they requested that local sponsors work through the MPO first um, to get to CDOT because there are these policy implications right associated with tips, and it's not just it's not just the Dr. Cog MPO, it's North Front Range, it's uh, Pikes Peak, right? I mean, they they also have their own tips and their own tip policy um, issues um, to deal with. So I think CDOT uh, was gracious in sort of acknowledging uh, to the MPOs that they wanted they wanted those discussions for locally sponsored projects within the MPOs um, to be able to work through the MPO tips um, before CDOT would agree to to utilize or allow toll credits for those locally sponsored projects. Great. Thanks, Ron. Rebecca. All right. Thank you, Director Williams. All right. It looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Jim Dale. Director Dale, go ahead. Thank you. I, I agree with what Director Teal and Director Action have talked about, but with the tolls, you know, we really aren't going to know. It's, like Herb said, we're not going to know much about our budgets. Probably we do a two-year budget and go until like we're going to be working hard in September, October. But it's this toll money is a very interesting issue. So if we're going first come first serve on you, guess you I guess you're a fortune teller on some of these local agencies that are be able to come up with uh, enough funds to go ahead with it. So it would I would really think that we we could delay sub-regional conferences uh, to give us cities a chance and, and counties to look at their budgets and start formulating them and still have a chance at the 800 million in toll funds that would be pretty appropriate so the first come first serve you know it has its merits, but it has its drawbacks that there could be some controls about priorities that are established across the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Dale, for your comment. Our next question or comment is from Stephanie Walton. Director Walton, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, it seems like discussing it at the sub forum level uh, makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the thinking here, it's important to, I think, weigh these pros and cons, um, but I am inclined to consider a process that keeps money flowing um, sooner rather than later, because I do think that this, these funds and um, whatever, whatever we can do to help with local match and keep projects moving will, I think are important dollars for the economy and jobs here in Colorado. So, and I just think that we, I, I don't want to see Colorado and any of our communities slip behind on some of these important transportation projects. Um, the um, question that I have is, I was wondering the letter that went to um, the U.S. Department of Transportation advocating that there maybe be funds um, that would flow to local communities to help um, with relief on these on the local match. Um, is there any hope there or progress that's been made? Thank you. Um, yeah, Director, thanks for the question. There's a lot of advocacy going around. There's a lot of discussion happening at the federal level about sort of a, a next um, COVID response bill we don't we don't know quite frankly um how those conversations are going uh what's what will happen i know that congress is wrestling with some pretty significant issues with basic response like 
unemployment um, payments and stimulus payments to families and individuals. Uh, but there is talk about infrastructure um, packages, whether that is a infrastructure stimulus package or whether Congress sort of gets gets their act together and figures out reauthorization of the FAST Act, which is due by October 1 of this year, uh, probably won't meet that deadline. Um, but sort of the shape of that reauthorization bill may bring additional federal dollars above what was originally anticipated um, in the near term if Congress kind of increases the overall authorized funding levels. Um, I know the House version of uh, the reauthorization bill that got incorporated into a very, very large uh, bill uh, that was passed by the House a couple of weeks ago um, included a provision that next year's transportation dollars would be 100% federal, so they, they would not have the non-federal match requirement, uh, which obviously is another way to, to address this issue. So there's just there's just a lot of uncertainty around this whole issue. So I think what we're trying to do is talk about the things that we can control and be nimble and be able to react as we learn as we learn more and as as the situation becomes clearer. All right, Director Walton, Thank did you. you have any additional questions or comments? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Tammy Maurer, Director Maurer. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Pastors. That was a good presentation on that. Um, makes, a, makes you think a lot about different things. Um, just going through this real quick, you know, just looking at like scope reductions, um, being a um, prior CDOT uh, project engineer, that was a known thing that you had to do sometimes it it hurts it really hurts but i guess i guess the thing the board would have to look at is well maybe we pull out the sidewalk but maybe that sidewalk or that multi-use path as a part of that project was part of it how that project was a you know it was able to move forward so i guess we just have to look at that and think about that um one thing my question is though is um i just look at you know, some agencies, some regions are, are going to have bigger revenue shortfalls than others for various reasons. Or, you know, do we think that we are going to have to have a criteria to say, OK, if you didn't, you know, kind of like the uh, CARES dollars, if you could meet 25 percent, you know, a loss in your revenues or whatever, then, you know, you were allocated dollars. So do we think we might be looking, needing to look at that? And, and maybe that is the discussion with sub-regional, but I'm just wondering if, what your th thoughts are on that. Um, thank you, Director Maurer. Um, challenging, right? I mean, I think that that's the issue we're struggling with is how much do we go beyond sort of requiring some demonstration of hardship uh, in order to consider a request to either reduce scope or um, utilize unprogrammed federal funds or give a waiver or an extension to the, to the delay deadline. Um, I don't know what the, I, I honestly don't know what the right criteria is if you, if you want to set a criteria. Um, I, I think um, just requiring some documentation and expression of the impact so that we can assess and and sort of make a decision i think it's it's just really a, a significant struggle for me to say sort of it would have to, you know you'd have to show that you had a 25 percent reduction in your transportation revenues or a 10 percent reduction in your transportation revenues um, uh, and every jurisdiction is dealing with the impacts in different ways you know some jurisdictions are have and are laying off staff um, and, and the impacts go well beyond transportation. Uh, jurisdictions are experiencing increased costs of just uh, responding to and providing uh, serve other general services um, as a result of COVID-19. They're having other financial impacts to, to their other services they provide. So transportation is just one slice of what all of you um, provide in terms of services to your communities. And we certainly recognize that. So um, I guess I'm, I'm going to decline to specifically mm -hmm. answer your question um, because I don't know. 
and that's fine. It's just it's just something to think about, I guess. And that's where I was going. So thank you very much for your caring words. Thank you so much, Director Maurer, for your comments and question. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from Ashley Stolzman, Director Stolzman. Thank you. Um, so I agree completely with Director Walton and Director Teal. Um, and I just wanted to add um, sort of a question slash comment. Um, so that would be on the regional projects. Is the staff recommendation on the regional projects then to just go ahead with the typical waitlist procedure given the importance of the regional projects and the fact that the entire board selected them and some of the challenges we would have if we were to deviate from our protocol on those regional um, different things? Director Stoltzman, that, that, that is the intent. And I think it, part of it is the scale of those projects too um, and, and, and the regional nature of those projects. Um, yes, so th that's the intent is that those projects would um, be addressed through the, through the typical waitlist protocol. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Stolzman. Our next question or comment is from uh, Roger Partridge, Director Partridge. Thank you. Ron, can you explain a little bit what toll credits are? I have to say, I don't understand it. And I wonder if they're very similar to the business tax credits that the legislature is looking to sell, basically, where a business who had tax credits someone would buy those they would basically be at a discounted rate when those tax credits would be available so it's you know it's kind of like kicking the can down the road you you, you pay now you get a cash influx but it's taken giving money now for what actually would have been more later is that what the toll credits are i'm just wondering um for, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Director Partridge, uh, and good evening. Um, actually, no, they are, they do not operate like that. Thankfully, um, uh, they so toll credits have been around for gosh, I don't know how many, a uh, couple of at least several reauthorization transportation reauthorization uh, bills, um, but and and many states have lots of toll credits that have accumulated, probably more than they would ever be able to utilize. And there have been efforts over the years to even allow states to trade toll credits um, amongst themselves uh, for cash because they, they do have some, some utility and some value for states that don't accumulate toll credits because they don't have toll facilities um, in place. Um, that those discussions haven't amounted to to anything yet. There has there's not a there's not a way for states to to trade toll credits that way. But they don't work like that like that business tax credit um, in that same way. They are a tool that the federal that the federal government has authorized um, in order to acknowledge I think those states that are constructing or have constructed projects using tolls and charging tolls to utilize those public facilities. So they have to be, so it has to be toll, toll, toll facilities on public roads. Um, and it's, I think it's an acknowledgement. Um, the theory is that that has reduced the burden on the federal government to spend federal transportation dollars on those facilities. And so it's, it basically just gives some credit to those states and allows them to use those credits to substitute for match for the federal funds. So in that way, they don't operate the same way as those business tax credits you were referring to. Great, thank you for that explanation, Ron. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, Director Partridge. And with that, I do not see any additional questions or comments, so I will hand it back to our chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, <clears throat> sounds like we um, were open to using the sub-regional forms to go through the go through these challenging times and and what these challenging times uh, present um, you know it's uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how we navigate this and to me I think flexibility is going to be at a premium so again thank you Mr. Papstorf thank you Mr. Chair thank you directors really appreciate the the engagement and the feedback the uh, the next item on the agenda is item 12 committee reports uh, first report is the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Director Jones, please. 
Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yay! My technology is still working. So the news from Stack, if you hadn't heard, former Dr. Cogger and Broomfield Mayor Karen Stewart was voted chair of the Transportation Commission. And at the Stack's July 10th meeting, we had a update on the budget forecast. Ron just sort of went through how the HUTF funds are going to be impacted by COVID as well as you know ongoing fuel efficiency. CDOT's anticipating a decline of about 63 million in 2020-2021 and is in the process of identifying options to close that gap. We got an update on the financial status of transit agencies across the state. It will not be a surprise to hear that a number are having major financial issues, even with the CARES Act funding. RTD is included in that, although I guess the good news is that the recent forecasts aren't as bad as the original predictions were going to be for RTD. Um, we had a very big discussion about uh, Senate Bill 267 transit projects. As you may remember, the Transportation Commission adopted a four-year list of Senate Bill 26, 267 transit projects last December, but because of the COVID budget situation, um, we're now looking at the likelihood of only the first two years of Senate Bill 267 funding happening. And that's a reduction of, well, be about 97 million rather than the 144 million that was originally allocated. So um, there's a discussion about how to do that for Dr. Cog. Um, some money's already been committed and that includes the $6 million for the Longmont Firestone Mobility Hub project, which is in region four. Um, and then of the remaining funds, Dr. Cog has proposed to get about 42 million in projects, which almost not quite gets us to regional equity. There was also a big discussion about um, adding back projects from the non-transit portion of Senate Bill 267. Um, there's currently about $107 million to be allocated because the legislature was a little bit nicer and circumstances were a little bit nicer to CDOT than were originally anticipated. So, and also CDOT staff are planning for the potential of having a third year of Senate Bill 267 funding or maybe a federal stimulus package. So they were planning ahead for what those projects might be that get added back in. So, and all those projects would come off the 10 year plan that we all just went through. So for phase one, which is the 170 million, 107 million that's in the bank, 87 million would be put back into projects and about 20 million retained for pre-construction activities. And the funds would be focused solely in regions that are behind on regional equity, which includes Dr. Cog. So we would be getting $25 million in funding for safer main streets, and the I-70 Harlan Bridge replacement. And if phase two materializes that, that $500 million that might come through stimulus funds or the like, um, we would region one would get an additional $230 million of projects like um, for things like the bridge replacements on I-70 and 270 and the Floyd Hill project. So stay tuned on that. Um, and then also at the meeting, Rebecca White gave us an update on the statewide transportation plan which the stack will be asked to adopt in August. And then last but not least, we got an overview of the new CDOT grant opportunities that include the revitalizing Main Streets program, the community telework challenge, and then the safer Main Streets program that Dr. Cog's doing. So that is the news from stack. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Atchison. Metro Mayor's Caucus meets tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, uh, I have been told by Director Partridge, uh, there is no report. Uh, next uh, report is from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. Sanchez-Warren, please. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, we had our Advisory Committee in June on the 12th um, of June, and I already gave you that report. Uh, we're not having one in July, but I did want to give you an update on the um, a transfer from SRC to VIA, uh, the AAA transportation program. Um, there was great collaboration between SRC staff and VIA staff, and I'm happy to report that um, on July 1st, when that, trans that, that uh, transition happened officially, 
everyone that was scheduled for a ride got a ride. Um, I'm hearing very, very positive reports from uh, consumers, so that's wonderful. The only challenge that VIA is telling me that they're having is, is finding drivers, and that's not an uncommon problem, but a lot of the drivers that worked for SRC have actually moved out of the state of Colorado, so that's very unfortunate. They're having a hard time finding drivers, but uh, the good news is nobody missed a ride, which is I'm so happy about. That's the end of my report. Good news. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Uh, the next report is the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple items, agenda items to report on. One, we had an update on the ozone, ozone season to date, and uh, we had an overview of the draft serious area uh, state implementation plan. Um, and chapter review, we're getting really close to having a um, a final draft SIP, uh, which will go up for public review uh, here here real soon. So that's my report, sir. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Uh, next report, E470 Authority, Director Teal. Thank you, Chairman. Um, kind of a a, a um, kind of a big meeting that was had on July 9th. Um, uh, we handled, uh, the board was presented with and passed a remnant parcel resolution that simplifies and streamlines. The process of disposing of authority property is no longer needed. Uh, City of Aurora did bring forward an IGA for the 64th Avenue interchange uh, proposal, uh, which the board did agree to. I think the biggest piece came from the financial department's brief uh, based on the results of the uh, 2020 bond transaction. Um, uh, on June 10th, 2020, E470 sold uh, 167 million of its senior revenue bonds and closed on the transaction on June 18th. The new 2020 bonds were rated A by Standard & Poor's and A2 by Moody's. The selling of the 167 million in bonds was coupled with a $50 million cash contribution that was used to pay off callable bonds from 2004 and 2010, totaling approximately $250 million that had significantly higher interest rates and yields above 5.25%. The bond sale was met with an extremely positive response from municipal bond investors as the authority was able to generate more than $4.4 billion in orders over a 26 times over, excuse me, or it was over 26 times oversubscribed from more than 70 investor accounts. This excess demanded, demand allowed the authority to achieve improved savings and borrowing rates and was able to lock in an all in true interest cost of 2.8% on the transaction. So we were all pretty uh, pretty happy with how that went on the board. Uh, there was a traffic update that was provided for uh, E470. Um, right now, we are looking at um, really traffic on E470 is down uh, in the 40 percentile. Um, it's improving over mid-April, where uh, traffic on E470 was down 67%. Um, we did have some updates from the operations department, but it was really the financial update that uh, uh, really took up the lion's share of the time. Uh, Chairman, of course, you participate in the financial uh, subcommittee at the uh, E470. I turn it over to you if you'd like to share anything further with the board. Yeah, just, I mean, high level, um, the, uh, the the bond sale uh, generated an $80 million savings. Um, the, the rate of return typically on a bond refinancing is 5 to 7% as a target. Uh, this bond refinancing um, generated over a 30% return. So um, good things for E470. We've achieved level debt at the 2004 board goal, and it will hopefully propel us very, very shortly to reduce tolls. Um, so with that, um, I, I conclude my additional analysis. Uh, the next report is for CDOT. Uh, Director Wright, please. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, you know, most of what I would update you all from the, the CDOT end has been very well covered by um, other members of the Dr. Cog board and executive director earlier tonight. Um, but just to reiterate a couple of those, we are so pleased uh, to have announced the Safer Main Streets program. And thank you again for the partnership with Dr. Cog and for Doug Rex's and Chair Dyack's participation in that press. Uh, announcement we had, and we were um, also really pleased to see the FHW admin administrator join, albeit remotely, um, but a really nice event, and we're all, all excited at CDOT to see the results of that program. Uh, the other key piece for us was well covered by uh, Director Jones. We continue to work through our scenario of planning around Senate Bill 267. The dollars that have come back into CDOT um, and those we hope to receive uh, should we see a year three of Senate Bill 267, a federal stimulus bill, and then maybe one day uh, a year four of Senate Bill 267. So uh, we briefed our Transportation Commission on those topics today and that conversation went well. So I expect um, a lot of what Director Jones covered um, tonight in terms of the allocations to, to go ahead and move forward. Uh, the, the third piece I will touch on just briefly is yesterday we did announce a uh, clean truck strategy in, in partnership with the Colorado Energy Office and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, and this is really looking at opportunities to uh, advance uh, clean uh, technology into freight, including uh, increased electrification. So we're, we're looking at a broad range of things from increasing infrastructure uh, so that these uh, trucks can charge as they come into the fleet, uh, fleet turnover, encouraging our, our freight partners to join the SmartWay program. Uh, so just a, a range of opportunities there and, and really building on, on what we've seen through COVID and the importance of freight uh, that is that we have today in our economy and, and will in the future. and, and Coming, kind of coming along with that, recognizing that as we will continue to have trucks out there, it would sure be great um, if they were able to reduce their emissions. So there's more on that on the CDOT website. Uh, and then I will end with a, a thank you to Ron Papstor for not making me explain toll credits at eight o'clock on a Wednesday night. Um, but again, we're, we're very glad to be able to provide these and, and hope they can be of use to our local partners. Thank you, Chair. That's it for me tonight. Thank you, Director White. Uh, next report, Fast Tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you. Our, I'm starting with a run time, a travel time, 29 minutes. That is how long it will take to travel between 124th Avenue and Denver Union Station on the N line or the North Metro line when it opens on September 21st. Still working on, on all the details for the grand opening in this COVID impacted world and the exact opening schedule, detailed schedule, operating schedule is coming soon. But 29 minute run time from 124th to Denver Union Station for the end line and that's opening on September 21st. So we're looking forward to that. RTD is also planning on updating our financial projections for the unfunded fast tracks plan, intending to do that and provide it to our um, board of directors and to stakeholders this fall. So the two highlights on fast tracks, a couple other quick hits though, um, in terms of reimagine RTD, the focus at RTD is on the system optimization plan and particularly bus and the bus and rail service plan for this January, for January 2021 in the severely financially constrained world that we're in. Um, so the RTD board of directors, our technical working group and advisory committee are really starting to delve into the opportunities and big financial constraints around that January 2021 bus and rail service plan for Reimagine RTD. We're also looking at a uh, scenario that we intend and hope and expect to be able to build towards in the 2023 to 2026 
time frame, um, which will be more robust and it will be dependent on uh, financial recovery. And finally, right now, last night and um, at their board meeting next week, our board of directors is considering a set of COVID budget response principles to help guide RTD staff and um, and our policy making decisions through the times ahead. And so that information is um, printed and the details on what those principles that are under consideration are, are published in the operations committees or was it finance administration? The minutes from, or the meeting uh, materials from last night. That concludes my update on RTD. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Uh, next uh, next section, administrative items. Item uh, 13, next meeting is August 19th. Item 14, other matters by members. Is there any other, is there any matters by members you would like to bring at this time? Ms. Stevens, do you see any hands? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Great, thank you. Uh, next uh, item, item 15, we will adjourn at 8.20 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great month. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.